In 1935, Roosevelt backed the National Labor Relations Act, or Wagner Act, that put the power of the federal government behind workers' right to organize. The Wagner Act made illegal many of the anti-union and discriminatory and violent activities of managers against workers. It said that it was in the national interest to form trade unions and that uh, the rights of workers to free speech, to assembly, uh, will be protected within the bosom of the corporation itself, within the bosom of the workplace itself. This is, in fact, a very radical extension of government power. Think about it for a moment. If you have a factory in Birmingham, Alabama, imagine the racial divisions that exist there. Imagine the difficulties of black and white workers in Birmingham voting anywhere outside the factory in it. And imagine federal officials coming to that steel plant in Birmingham and having a ballot box in which blacks and whites themselves are voting secretly and are voting against their traditional you know, foremen and superintendents who've been running that show for 60 years. That has a tremendously democratic uh, potential. All we wanted was a president who would hold the light for us while we went out and organized. From all of you good workers, good news to you I'll tell Of how the good old union has come in here to dwell with corporations and politicians wary of the new Wagner Act, organized labor itself reached a defining moment. Long dominated by the skilled craftsmen of the American Federation of Labor, a new mandate was proposed to organize all workers together, skilled and unskilled. It's one of the famous moments in American organized labor history. 1935 convention, John L. Lewis, who's this big, burly guy with his wild hair and kind of one giant eyebrow across his forehead, gets up at the convention and he says, the time has come to organize the working people of America. The president of the Carpenters Union gets up and he says, John, nice speech. We're not going to do that. We've never done that. We're not doing it now. Now, John L. Lewis is a reasonable kind of guy. He just hears an opposing opinion throws himself at the president of the Carpenters Union, hits him in the face. They start swinging away at each other. They're rolling around on the floor of the AFL convention. The other delegates rush over and separate them. John L. Lewis gets up, he brushes himself off, he walks out of the AFL convention, and he never comes back. He then forms a new labor federation, the Congress of Industrial Organizations, the CIO whose sole purpose is to organize the major industries of America, which means organizing unskilled workers. This union maid was wise to the tricks of company spies. She couldn't be fooled by company stools. She'd always organize the guys. She'd always get her way. When she Though the first strikes were planned for the steel industry, workers at the General Motors plant in Flint, Michigan, jumped the gun. What they decided to do is stage a sit-down strike. In other words, what they did, instead of leaving the plant, they sat down right inside the plant and they said, we're not leaving until we get the union recognition from General Motors that the federal government says we have a right to have. And that's a dramatic thing to do, but it also is it's an incredibly good tactic because it means that General Motors can't run its plant. And suddenly this huge General Motors empire that stretched all around the United States was starting to creak. It was having a hard time maintaining production. And finally, General Motors had no choice. And so in February 1937, they recognized the right of these workers to form a union called the United Automobile Workers. That was the largest industrial corporation in the world, brought to its knees by a handful of guys inside their plan. When that happened, the floodgates were open for the CIO. Fellow workers, we want peace and prosperity in this country here. That's what we're fighting for, and that's what we're going to have. Chrysler, U.S. Steel, and General Electric soon followed. And though there were notable holdouts, by 1939, the core of industrial America was organized. For many workers who remained outside union protection, Congress passed the Fair Labor Standards Act, which set a minimum wage, maximum hours, and finally curbed the use of child labor. 
These worker protections were protested on both sides, by those who thought they went too far and those who thought they didn't go far enough in covering all workers. But for all its flaws, New Deal labor legislation forever altered the landscape between labor and business and the government's role in their relationship. When there's no question anymore that it's going to stay, American working life was utterly different. Ordinary people, for the first time, feel a direct connection to their government. They feel it's their government. This was a moment in time when the working class felt they had a stake in their government and their government had a stake in them.